When we're looking at Australopithecines, we have several different species of Australopithecines, but the best way to look at um, the group as a whole is to look at a change over time from the early ancestors to the later ancestors within the genus. So what we have here is we have an early individual and a late individual. And we consider these two separate groups of Australopithecines. Our smaller one is going to have smaller teeth, no crusting, and a bunch of other features. And we call these guys the gracile's versus these guys over here that have the bigger cheeks, the sagittal crest, the bigger teeth. They're what we call robust. So gracile versus robust in this regard simply refers to size of the face, size of the skull, and it all comes down to a chewing complex. Um, these guys tend to eat more fruits and roots, um, grasses, things that are going to be harsher, whereas the um, gracile's, they're going to focus more exclusively on fruits and leaves, things that we're going to see in a forested environment versus a more grassland environment for our robusts here. So in order to look at this change over time from our grassiles to our robusts, we have to start with understanding some of the um, names of the features that we're going to see different and see show up in the later species that are going to be absent in our earlier species. So I'm going to put our gracile off to the side for a minute here and just start out with my robust. So with this robust, one of the first things hopefully you saw is the wideness of the cheekbones here, these zygomatics. Um, and notice also how they're sitting forward. This is what we call flaring zygomatics. So they're wide, they're out to the side, but they've also moved forward. So if I pull my gracile back in, you can see that from the nose, the zygomatics curve back whereas in our robust, it's just straight across from the nose to those zygomatics. What this does is if we look from the top view um, of both of these, you can see that zygomatic arch, and you can see how much wider that zygomatic arch is on our robust. So it's allowing for a muscle to come up underneath here, and that links to that lower jaw and allows for chewing. So we have this muscle coming in here, coming all the way down to the jaw, and it's just giving a much bigger chewing complex. Um, and that comes to the next part, let me unhook his jaw here, um, where you're looking at the teeth. So here we've got what we call megadontia, also known as simply big teeth, okay? Mega meaning big. So here is our gracile, okay, relatively small teeth in comparison to our robust, um, where the teeth are much, much larger. Okay, so megadontia simply means big teeth. The teeth have gotten much larger over time, and I'm just going to kind of zoom in on that for you, uh, bringing them up to the camera, where you can see just how big those molars have gotten and the premolars have gotten um, in our robust versus our grasso. Now that's also going to thicken the mandible itself, so when you look at the thickness of the mandible, if I flip it over here, you can see how thick that area is for what those teeth to sit in versus our grasso, it's going to be much thinner. So it all starts with the teeth. The bigger the teeth, the bigger the muscles needed to move those teeth. So if we put the rest of the skull back together here, and we have our two uh, skulls, and you can see much difference in terms of that zygomatic. Um, then, as those muscles flare up the sides, okay, causing those zygomatics to flare out, it's also going to come up and attach at the top. And as those two muscles come together at the top of the skull and they meet, now they need an area to attach to as they continue to get bigger. And that results in this sagittal crest, um, this ridge of bone right here. So smaller on this individual, we pull another individual over here and you can see a much bigger crest. Um, in general, this is a sexually dimorphic feature um, with males having a larger crest than females. Um, but Overall, it has to do with that chewing complex. Okay. Uh, those are our main features that we see with the robusts. We've got the flaring zygomatics, the dished face. Oh, the dished face, I'm sorry. Um, so those flaring zygomatics cause this face to become very flat. So if we look from the side view, how very, very flat that face is. I'll flip it this way as well. Um, how it is just kind of almost indented in the center. Whereas if we look at our gracile again, 
we've got much more contour here from the cheekbone up to the nose and then back down. Um, so more of a contoured face versus a dished face. Okay. Now notice though that they both do still project forward in front of the eye orbit. So if we're looking straight down on them, straight from the eye orbit okay, down, that face is projecting. It's sticking forward um, in front of the eye orbits. And same thing here. So that projection um, in the lower face, in the maxilla, as well as the flaring zygomatics, give it this almost pushed in appearance to the middle in our robusts. So our robust, again, flaring zygomatics, that dished face, um, coming up into that sagittal crest, and then of course the teeth being very, very large um, and having that megadontia. Now some species are going to have teeth that get so big that the premolars actually start getting extra cusps and they get really, really big, and we call that molarized premolars. And we're only going to see that in some species, not every species is going to have those really, really big premolars. And it's usually the second premolar. So here, hopefully you can see um, that the first premolar really just has two cusps. It's kind of still that oval shape. But our, mole, our second premolar here is much more rounded um, and has extra cusps. So one, two, three, and four cusps here, same as our other molars. Um, and then it appears as though we only have one premolar, but we really still have the two. Um, but you can see that megadontia getting really, really large here. The grass cells are simply going to have the absence of these features. Okay, we don't have the flaring zygomatics. We don't have the flattening causing the dished face. We don't have that sagittal crest showing up. Um, so it's the absence of all of those traits that indicate the heavy chewing. So at this point, we've done a separation between our gracile's and our robusts. Our gracile's right here and our robusts, and these guys and these guys. Now the other separation that we need to look at is the difference between East African fossils and South African fossils. And there's one main feature that we look at. It's something that we call the compound temporal nuchal crest versus just a nuchal crest. So temporal. If we think about the temporal bone is on the side here. So temporal nuchal means that the crest starts on the side, right above the mastoid process, starts on the side, and works its way around the back of the skull to the other side. So we have a constant crest all the way across from side to side. Okay, here's another example of that compound temporal nuchal crest. Okay, how it starts here, wraps all the way around the back, Okay, to the other side. So that when we look at it from a straight back view, it almost looks as though the skull has wings okay, coming off the sides here and here. Okay, as opposed to, again I'll flip it around, so it looks like we have kind of these pinched off wings um, across the back. Versus here where we just have the sides going straight down and we still have the crest just across the back. So we just have a nuchal crest but no temporal crest, so just the nuchal. Okay. And that's going to be a difference between our East African fossils, so this is an East African fossil, and our South African fossils, which is one, what this one is. Okay. Now we're going to see gracile's and robusts in each area, so this kind of puts us into a four category um, block um, that you can see in your book and that I'll pull up as a PowerPoint next. So Australopithecus afarensis is our earliest Australopithecus in time that we're going to be looking at. Now here I have a male and a female um, Australopithecus afarensis. You can see that they are both gracile's. They do not have the sagittal crest, although they do have almost what we call a precursor to that crest. So we've got a little bit of ridging going on um, that's leaning towards those muscles getting larger. Um, we have the smaller teeth. Um, of the gracile australopithecines, but we do have an East African, so we have that um, temporal crest leading into the nuchal crest, so the compound temporal nuchal crest. So it's a gracile, um, but it's an East African gracile. Now, one thing that's specific about this species is that they have a feature called the diastema. They have that space between the larger canine and the incisors on the top, larger canine and the premolars on the lower jaw. 
but you can see that diastema right here, um, that space between the incisor. So they do have an elongated canine. They are the only species of Australopithecines that do have that elongated canine. And it's not super long, so it's not that much bigger than the rest of the teeth, but it is slightly bigger. And so we do see that definitive space, that definitive diastema. So that's our Australopithecus afarensis. Um, and again, male and female, we do see sexual dimorphism in this species. The second species of Australopithecus that we're going to look at is Australopithecus africanus. This is a South African Australopithecine. Again, if we look at the back here, we do not have that temporal part of the crest, just the nuchal crest. Um, so that's going to tell us we're in South Africa. Does not have the sagittal crest, does not have the dished face um, or the really big teeth. So again, we're looking at a gracile here with Australopithecus africanus. Um, please note that it does have the projecting face. This particular individual is quite often confused with um, our early species within genus Homo. So this is a fe uh, species that we're going to be looking at in comparison to Homo habilis um, later. In South Africa, we only have one species currently of robust Australopithecines. So here, this is Australopithecus robustus. Um, you can see the dished face here, um, the wide zygomatics, and here we can see that start of a sagittal crest. So on this particular fossil, this part back here is what we call an endocast. It's a cast of the inside of the skull, the brain case, um, and we have breakage or damage, so we don't actually have the rest of the sagittal crest. Um, and then in this individual, this is a female, where we do not see the sagittal crest, but again, we do still see the flaring zygomatics, um, and that dish face, as well as the large teeth. Now, with our South African robust, we do, and this one again has very bad teeth to look at, but the female, you can see the teeth very easily. You can see that the premolars, here I'll come nice and close, the premolars are still that oval shape, so they're not molarized, whereas the molars um, have that more rounded shape. So non-molarized premolars um, helps us identify South African. Also, notice that we have um, a temporal crest, but it doesn't run into a nuchal crest. So we have one of the two crests, but not both. That's going to help us identify this as a South African fossil. Um, so again, sexual dimorphism is going to be sagittal crest versus no sagittal crest, but both of these are um, Australopithecus robustus. So Australopithecus aethiopicus is what we're seeing here. Um, this is a single fossil for this species. We don't have any other fossils um, of this species at this point. Um, one of the things that you um, should note with this is its nickname is the black skull. Um, and it's nicknamed that simply because of the sediment that it fossilized in was dark in color. So the fossilization process um, basically just turned the sediment dark. Um, so instead of the more tan or brown tones, this was more in an ashy environment, so we got more of the blacker tones to that fossilization. But again, um, we can see that compound temporonuchal crust okay, coming off the sides, going into the back, telling us this is an East African fossil. Um, we have that sagittal crest, the flaring zygomatics, which you can see both from the top and the front, giving that dished face. Um, indicating a robust specimen. Now with this particular guy, if we look at the teeth, you'll notice that the teeth are all missing. There aren't any. But we can actually look at where the teeth sat. So we can look at the width of the tooth row right, on either side, and that's a really, really wide segment. So that tells us they had pretty big teeth. We're not able to identify if they had molarized premolars or not, because of course the cusps are missing. All we have is the roots. So all we know is that they did have megadontia. We are not able to determine if it resulted in uh, molars, premolars or not. But again, East African because of the compound temporal nuchal crest, and then definitely robust with that sagittal crest, the dish face, and the flaring zygomatics. The most recent of the Australopithecines 
is Australopithecus boisei. And Australopithecus boisei is, again, an East African species. So, again, we've got our temporal crust leading into our nuchal crust. So, we've got the compound temporal nuchal. Right? It does have the sagittal crust, even though it's a small one, along with the flaring zygomatics and the dish face and the really big teeth. See, I can get you a view of the teeth there. Um, so this all tells us that we are looking at a robust um, Australopithecine. Um, and again, if we look at the teeth closely, um, we'll see that the premolars are starting to become more rounded, getting to that molarized premolars. Um, so we're going to see them in um, Australopithecus boisei, maybe in Australopithecus aethiopicus, but not in Australopithecus robustus. So we're not going to see those molarized premolars in our South African grass or South African robust. I'm sorry, just our South African grassiles. Ah, not our South African grassiles, just our East African robusts. Now that you have looked at all the different Australopithecine species and understand the different features that we see in Australopithecines, if you look on page 159, you'll see a chart similar to the one pictured here. At this point, what I would recommend is pausing this video so that you can then transfer the information in this chart where you see the grass owls and the robusts in East Africa and the grass owls and robusts in South Africa onto the chart on page 159. So what you're looking at here is that the different groups have different features depending on where they are and whether their grass owls are robust. The second chart is also going to go onto the chart on page 159. And this one shows you which species fit in each group. So what you'll notice is for three of the four categories, we only have one species in each group. Um, the grass isle East African is Australopithecus afarensis, grass isle South African, um, Australopithecus africanus, uh, robust South African, Australopithecus robustus. But in East Africa, we have two species, Australopithecus boisei and Australopithecus aethiopicus. And the biggest difference that we see here is pretty much in the size of the sagittal crest, the size of the flaring zygomatics. Overall, Australopithecus aethiopicus is a bigger um, robust. So it has bigger teeth, bigger cresting, bigger flares for all the features. So when you compare Boisei and aethiopicus, the key to identifying the difference between the two of them is that aethiopicus is bigger and Boisei is smaller. So at this point, you should have filled in both charts, or the, the one chart on page 59, 159, using the information from the two charts listed in this video. In class, next time, we will be looking at the um, skulls themselves, identifying how we, are looking at how we identify each species.